our friendships do really determine the quality of our lives. But I want to come to those relationships with my best energy, not just because I, I need them. I want to come to them because I want them. What you're about to hear is an interview between me and Francesca Spector, who is the author of the book Alonement, which is basically a guide on how to spend time by yourself uh, while owning the process. Alonement, um, this, this word that I later invented to describe positive time alone. Alonement became this thing that I couldn't stop thinking about, writing about. It wasn't just for the gratuity of getting likes or whatever, it was it was self-fulfilling. We talk about this balance between productivity and self-care. We talk about the struggles that a lot of us have with actually finding time to be alone with our thoughts and how being more intentional about the time that we spend alone uh, can actually help us, I guess, level up our lives and improve our mental health. We should all be able to spend a boring Monday evening comfortably alone and have the resources in us. I've taken away a bunch of things from this episode, in particular, this idea of alonement. And literally, as we were having the conversation, I put a block in my calendar for this evening to have some alone time to myself. And I feel like this concept is really going to help me actually find the, you know, the time, the space, the intentionality to spend time by myself. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Just a very quick thing before we get started, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast, either on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app of choice, then please do. It really helps us out a lot. I'd spent 2019 um, on a sort of, there's no better way to put this, on a personal development journey. Hmm. There, I said it. That's what I was doing. Um, What's so, wrong with that? That's great. We I love personal you development journeys. Really, but that, yeah. that was... That was what it was. You know, I'd started the year, actually late 2018, I'd just gone through um, a breakup. So I'd, I'd made the decision after a good few months to end a relationship um, with, you know, the person I thought would be my full stop. You know, the person I kind of had um, thought, you know, I'd marry. Um, I mean, you know, I was only sort of in my mid twenties at this point, but you know, I, I thought, okay, you know, I've, I've met, met my person, it's happening. Um, and then when that relationship broke down, I went through this phase where I started to I started to realize that everything I was doing was based around trying to get away from spending time alone. So I'd quite recently started at this tech company, um, which was great because it fed uh, the part, well, the big part of me that is an extrovert. It, you know, it said every every Thursday there'd be a happy hour, there'd be, you know, there'd be group lunches, there'd be all the, this time you spend with other people. And the combination with, you know, starting that job not long before um, going through this breakup and having these opportunities to sort of run away from my feelings. Um, and then, yeah, and, and then having this thing, I, I just really lent into that. Um, so I had this really weird clash where I was like, okay, Every, I'm doing everything they tell you you shouldn't do after a breakup. You know, I'm running away from my feelings. I'm having a loss of fun. Um, but it just felt a bit bottomless. Um, and I think I got to this point, I went through the Christmas season, um, you know, November, uh, December, um, back to back parties. So there was, there was so much going on. It's, it's amazing we got any work done, to be honest. But, um, and then January 2019. I had this revelation. I was like, I've been told my entire life that I'm an extrovert. And I've just started at this tech company that as a magazine journalist, I never quite thought I'd, you know, end up, <laughs> end up at. Um, and you know, it's way more, it's, it's way more sociable than previous times in my industry. Um, you know, I've got, you know, I've already got this existing base of lots of friends. I've got all these opportunities, um, to be away from my own company, but I, something, something's rankling here. Um, something feels wrong about this approach. Um, and you know, why, why am I going on, you know, a terrible date every other night just to get away from my own company? Why am I saying yes to every single work drinks? Surely I should be grieving this breakup in a slightly different way. Um, so that was, that was the personal development journey. So this was all running alongside the work. Um, 2019, I started thinking for myself but also blogging about alone time um which uh which was something that never had you know it sort of appealed to me as as a value that I should really be pursuing in my life um and I you know it it, it, it was this thing that you know I thought as a lifestyle journalist as a journalist generally you sort of you get very into a topic 
and then you leave it alone after a, you know a month or two. You know, if you're lucky, if you're if you're a digital journalist, you know, you literally write about it on the day, and then you then it's gone. Um, but alonement, um, this this word that I later invented to describe positive time alone, alonement became this thing that I couldn't stop thinking about, writing about. Um, it it wasn't just for the gratuity of getting likes or whatever. It was it was self fulfilling. And as this thing kind of existed alongside my day job, I was like, this is the topic I want to be writing about. This is where I want the culmination of my skill set to mm. come into, um, into, you know, in, into thinking about this, into writing about it, into having conversations with other people around it. Because I had a inkling, you know, as I was going on that, you know, when I was sitting there at this happy hour, which had gone on until 11.30 p.m. at night, then, you know, I wasn't the only hanger on there that actually was just sitting drinking this awful white wine to get away from their own thoughts and to get away from alone time. Um, and so towards the end of that year, that's when I started uh, thinking about ways that I could then make that my, you know, my full-time thing, my full-time nice. job. Love to spend a lot more time talking about uh, about the concept and, and, and the tips that you talk about in the book as well. Um, how... When you say you were on a personal development journey, like what did that look like? So it's funny because you know, no one, well, I think we all wake up on New Year's Day, right? We say we're going to start a New Year's development journey, um, but don't keep to it. For me, it's sort of, it, I think it came out of necessity as well. So I kind of, you know, as I say, like I, in a way, yes, I was surrounded by people. Um, but I suppose, I guess that cliche about being lonely in a room, so, you know, full of people, I looked around me and I saw that a lot of my friends were settling down in relationships, which, you know, for them were their sort of, you know, quote unquote, full stop love, um, was the thing that was going to take them away. Um, I was living alone. Um, I realized that actually I need, I, I felt the need to be on a personal development journey. I felt the need to sort of hold my own hand at that point because I didn't my friendships while still very strong had shifted um I suppose I it I suppose you could say I felt a bit isolated um but in a, in a way which was a platform for then needing to say okay look me and me and me need to have a talk um and the, the way that I have always done that as a you know, as someone who wanted to be a writer from the age of you know six from the age of learning to write was journaling so journaling was the cornerstone of me spending time alone that was the one way I knew to be healthily alone um and when I made this uh what, what was actually quite a belated new year's resolution to learn to spend time alone I think I um announced in a blog post I was going to do it on January 26th 2019 I said okay I, you know I don't know how I'm going to do this but the way I'm going to start is is through journaling um so I started journaling most days and you know in terms of personal development I think you can tweet all you want about what you're about to do you know in your personal development but when you say it to yourself that's when you put down the real building blocks because you I don't know you've you've sort of there's there's no uh, you, you're not getting any gratification from an out outward source you know you're being honest with yourself about your needs it's it's that sense of privacy that creates it. So, you know, that, that was the first thing, um, that I started doing. Um, and then I said, okay, well, you know, after a couple of months, I kind of said, look, I've developed this capacity to be a bit more okay with my thoughts, um, to, to sort of own what I want, what I need. Um, where can I go from this? Um, it's, it, you know, it's got to be incremental. Um, and so I guess, I guess I started challenging myself. Um, I think, you know, before, before we, um, came onto this recording, we were chatting about going to restaurants alone, eating dinner alone. Um, and I said to myself, right, well, I, you know, I used to really like, um, going for brunch at the weekends. Um, and don't get me wrong. If I, you know, I, I called up my friends, um, I gave them a week's notice or so that could still be a thing, but you know, I, I want to almost challenge myself in my personal development to be able to do that alone um and the you know the really good part of this as well was um my ex-boyfriend and I we always used to have you know, sort of bickering on the Saturday morning because you know, I wake up at sort of 7 8 a.m like a hyperactive puppy who wants to go out he was more of a sort of normal have a lion at the weekends kind of person so I started realizing that okay you know I not only 
am I going to challenge myself to do this? But I'm going to do it on my own terms. I'm going to get up at the time I want, go to the place I want mm. and do it. So yeah, I think it was all, through all those sort of micro challenges around alone time that I started kind of, I don't know, almost proving myself to myself. I guess that's the only really, that's the thing you can do with personal development. You can, you can sort of dream it, but actually it's the development only comes when you look back and you think, ah, like, I'm sitting here having brunch by myself and I'm enjoying myself. I, um, you know, a week ago, a month ago, that might have seemed like a, a really loserish thing to do or a really impossibly brave thing to do. Um, so, you know, so sort of look at me. Um, and then, you know, I, I think it was really, it was knowing that I had this, this one central challenge for myself, which was to learn to spend time alone better. And to look at the ways that I could do that. So not to say, you know, for instance, uh, mindfulness is a big thing that we talk about now. Um, and, you know, I've got to a point where um, I, um, you know, I, I meditate every single day. That's my non-negotiable. I wake up, I meditate uh, before I even put my contact lenses in, which is someone with probably the worst eyesight, eyesight out of anyone I know that that really is prioritizing something. Um, but I only came to mindfulness through that value of, look, my personal development journey is learning to spend alone, time alone, how is that going to sort of, how is mindfulness and learning mm. to spend time alone going to sort of go together? Yeah. How's that going to guide me? Um, so yeah, I think it was really just putting these building blocks in place. There were lots of different elements, but by the end of the year, I sort of looked back and I thought, wow, all these challenges, you know, I've, I've gone from journaling to, um, you know, to mindfulness, to brunch alone, to I've taken a, a week's holiday by myself. Look how far I've come. Uh, and it really, you know, it, I felt proud to have got there. Very quick tangent. Um, you said you posted on your blog, like, did you have a blog <laughs> like before then or like, yeah, what, what was the deal with the blog? Yeah. Talk about old mediums, right? Yeah. So I, not that, I mean, you know, I love to think that blogs could still be a thing. I think maybe it's slightly shifting there. I've always had a blog. I, well, I say always, I, yeah, I think I've always had on, you know, on different mediums. What was it? it was, you know, it was WordPress, I think I had, you know, I'm now on um, Squarespace. You know, I don't, I don't blog day to day now, but I had, I think I had, um, you know, my personal website, francescaspecter.co.uk, and that was where I would write personal blogs. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, and I think that's where I wrote the first thing. Um, or it could have been on a, on a now defunct blog. Um, but I, I'd always had something that I came to, usually after breakups. I'd usually kind of, my, I've had two serious breakups in my life. And after both of them, I got seriously into blogging. Um, I suppose if I was being very clever about it, it would have been the same site and I would have had a mailing list and I would have, yeah, you know, I, I would have really thought about the marketing of it. But it was just, you know, an internet room of one's own, right? So this isn't, I'm pretty sure the original article I wrote is, lost in the ether of the internet somewhere now but it was it was a space where i did announce to the audience that i had at the time i think that might have even been on facebook that i was doing this thing um it was just a way to communicate with the, a community effectively um so yeah I, I always had something i was never smart about it but i always had something where i could put out my thoughts and share them and feel comfortable hmm. doing that and okay so how how do you think about uh, what goes in a private journal versus what goes on blog? It's hard. Um, and I think you need both as well. Um, I like to think of it as, I think there needs to be, to avoid, to avoid being entirely self-indulgent, I think there needs to be almost like a, a trifold process. I think there needs to be writing in your private journal um, and that's where your thoughts are rawest. You know, that that is where you're thinking as you're writing. Um, that's the things that you reveal to yourself, you work things out, you know, and that can be, you know, that can be, you know, for want of a better word, ranting, that can be, oh, I hate the thing this person said. It was this, it was that, um, you know, it was so ridiculous of them. How dare they? And then as you're journaling, you go along and you get halfway down the page, you're like, wait a second, why did that make me feel like that? You know, am I being, you know, I'm just being triggered by that emotion. Um, and you sort of, you, you move forward from a place of instant reactivity to a place of, okay, I've digested this a bit. I was maybe just feeling a bit sensitive or maybe they had this context, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the journaling is the place where you get that part of your personality out. Um, 
the self-indulgent part, the you know slightly the whingier part, whatever. It needs to come out. Their, their thoughts, they deserve voicing, just not necessarily on a public forum. Um, although I don't, I think a lot of people on Twitter might, <laughs> might not quite realize that. So that's where you do that. Um, and then you know, there might be that mid step where you have conversations with people close to you. You sort of feel things out. You sort of ask your community on social media. You know, what do you you know, how, how do you feel about this thing? Um, you know, you can skip that step because sometimes it gets um, diluted. And then that's where you take to your, um, you know, if we talk about 2015, you take to your blog um, or you take to your uh, your newsletter if that's where you speak about things, you know, or you take to your podcast that so you, you've then digested and that's where those thoughts can then come out in a way that's considerate of kind of other people of a wider conversation that comes, you know, beyond just you. So yeah, it's that trifold process, I suppose. Just a quick note from one of our sponsors, and we'll get right back to the episode. And very excitingly, this episode is brought to you by Heights. Heights is a brain care smart supplement that I've actually been taking for the last 12 months, ever since I became friends with Dan Morisetto, who was the founder of Heights and who we had on the podcast in season one. And this season of the podcast, we're also featuring Dr. Tara Swart, who is a neuroscientist and psychiatrist. So what is Heights? Well, it's a brain care smart supplement. Basically, it is a supplement. You take two of them every morning like I do. It's like these two little capsules which have omega-3 oil in them, and they've got a bunch of multivitamins as well. They have all of the details on the website. It, every single ingredient that they've got is super high quality. And the great thing is that just by taking two of these capsules every morning, like I do, you get all of the essential micronutrients that you need without having to deal with drinking sludge or anything fancy like that. So the great thing about Heights is that even if you don't have one of these absolutely perfect diets, at least you know you have your basis covered in terms of the micronutrients that you need. It's very easy to sign up. You just go to yourheights.com and then you sign up to the thing and it's a mail order. They get to you every month or in three month packets. And if you use the coupon code ALI15, that's A-L-I-1-5 at checkout, then you'll get 15% off your first three months of subscription. I've been subscribed to this for the last 12 months. I also happen to be an investor in the company because I believe in the product and I love how they're fully evidence-based in absolutely everything they do. And if you're interested in the evidence base behind all like 20 different ingredients that they've got here, you can check them out on the website and that'll be linked in the video description and in the show notes. So thank you so much to Heights for sponsoring this episode. Just a quick message from one of our sponsors and we'll get right back to the episode. And this episode is very kindly brought to you by Shortform. Shortform is the world's best service that summarizes books, but it's way more than just book summaries. They almost have a whole study guide for every book that they've got on the platform where they've got a one page summary and then they also have chapter by chapter breakdowns. And it's not just chapter by chapter breakdowns. Also in between the chapter breakdowns, they have interactive exercises where you can engage more readily with the ideas in the book. Shortform covers non-fiction books from a bunch of different genres that you might be interested in. For example, they've got a load of stuff in the business world. So if, for example, you are an entrepreneur or you want to become an entrepreneur, that'll be great for you. They've got books in motivation. They've got books in education. They've got books in lifestyle and communication. Basically, any genre of like non-fiction, personal development self self-helpy stuff that will help you level up your life. It's all there on Shortform. Shortform publishes new book guides and articles every week. And if you're a subscriber, then you get to vote on what book they cover next. And in fact, through that system, I have voted for various books that they've then turned into summaries. For example, one book I've recently revisited on short form is in fact, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, pun not intended. Now I've read The E-Myth Revisited, I think twice, but I first read it back in 2019 and it completely changed the game for how I think about delegation. And it's probably one of the books I've most recommended to people who are in that stage where they're scaling up a business. But it's a little bit dense and I didn't really have much time on my hands. And so I just flicked through the short form summary of the e Revisited Revisited and came across a bunch of lessons that I didn't really take the first time around. Anyway, if any of that sounds up your street and you would like to sign up to the world's best service that summarizes books, then head over to shortform.com forward slash deep dive and that will give you a completely free five day trial and you can try out the service to your heart's content. That link will also be in the video description and in the show notes. And thank you so much, Shortform, for sponsoring this episode. Pre-personal development journey and the sort of discovering this how to spend time by yourself thing, if you were to just sort of sit in your flat in an evening by yourself, like what, what would you find yourself thinking about, feeling, doing? I think... It's it's funny because I'll say, you know, what I'm about to say is that, you know, if I'd be by myself of an evening, quite often I'd sit there and I'd be scrolling on my phone. I'll, I'll, I'll be watching TV and I'm, you know, I'm not admitting to a heroin addiction here. Am I? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> telling you anything particular that sounds I'm doing, like I'm doing anything particularly bad, but I think I was just really 
I, I, you know, I, I was so distracted. And I think like so many of us, I was, it was normal to me that I wasn't able to sit in and be with myself and do anything of substance. You know, for instance, I knew, uh, as I say, my whole life that I wanted to write books, um, but I never would have taken the time to do that because I wasn't comfortable enough to sit there and you know get to that place where I was comfortable enough to sit and write for a long time. Um, uh, what, I, I, what do you mean by that? Like not comfortable enough? And then, like if you were if you were to sit down at a laptop, what would be going through your mind? I think it's very. I think it's distraction. I think that we all. Um, I am quite influenced by, uh, I, may, maybe you've had him on the podcast, a man called Nir Eyal, mm, who, yeah. Um, he's, yeah, he's, um, you know, he writes amazing things, um, you know, kind of like Cal Newport around, you know, technology and addiction. And he says that effectively, you know, sometimes when we're, you know, phone addiction is just, is pain management, you know, so, you know, you'd be, I'd be doing something that, you know, everyone finds incredibly uncomfortable on one level, which is, you know, committing to a creative project or something that you know you really really want to do and you'll you'll get to a point where it's a little bit tricky um and you won't be in the flow of, of your work you'll be like okay i want to distract myself by going on my phone by you know checking the internet you know sometimes it, it, it's hard i think the process of writing is it's it's a more sophisticated process i suppose of being alone with your thoughts you know but it does it and, and i think that you need to build the building blocks of regularly journaling of regularly being comfortable in your own head of being able to be calm to be to get to get to that point of groundedness to then to then write um and so yeah i think i, I think I, I try and do all these things that i knew that i you know idealistically wanted to do with my life but i wasn't able to do them um you know i, I was too distracted and i think everything i was doing whether that was a you know a small term thing whether that was you know wanting to get into a series that I liked or, you know, I don't know, do a face mask, whatever. That was always, it always felt a bit frenetic. You know, there was always too much going on in my head. There was always some deeper level of, of pain, I suppose, that I hadn't dealt with some deeper, some deeper thoughts, some deeper, I suppose, you know, maybe deep down it was a sense of loneliness, to be honest, in the wake of my breakup that I wanted to get away from. So any sort of activity that in and of itself was, fulfilling satisfying for me on a personal level i'd sort of surrender to just this deep desire to get away from feeling any pain um and you know in myriad ways there's you know there's there's getting on tech there's emotional eating there's you know some you know for some people it's you know it's emotional drinking it's it's, it's like all these different things that we do to get away from ourselves um that actually take us away from our you know innermost hopes and dreams to i think you know sort of living our best lives. Yeah, I remember there was a period um, a few a few months ago where I, I distinctly had this thought where it's like I had, I had an evening with nothing in the calendar for the first time in what felt like weeks. And my immediate response was like, uh-oh, I, I now need to message everyone I know to be like, hey, do you fancy grabbing dinner? Fancy grabbing dinner? Nope, nope. Okay, cool. Go. I sort of like fifth person I asked was like, yeah, all right. I was like, great. Sorted. And... I mentioned this to my housemate and she was like, huh, that's a bit weird, isn't it? Like, why not just spend time by yourself? And I was, that, that question just like blew my mind because I was like, wait, yeah, I, I could just do that. I guess what I'd convinced myself at the time was that, oh, I could spend time by myself if I want. It's just, I prefer to spend time with other people because like, you know, when I'm dead, I'm not going to be, or when, when I'm on my, on my deathbed, I'm not going to be like, oh man, I wish I had more alone time. I probably wish... I had more time with friends. Uh, how did you think about that? Like, was this like a just a genuine preference of like I just like hanging out with people? Like, how did you realize that hmm, maybe there's something here that I'm trying to soothe? So I think, yeah, I think I never want my decisions to be motivated by this sheer panic, right? I kind of, you know, I want, I want to come at them from, you know, from calm, from like, oh, I want to spend time with that person. And I, I think that quite often I felt like I was in that panic state. Um, I mean, that, 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 uh, description of, you know, going through your phone book and looking for friends and, you know, just sort of feeling like you need to hang out with someone of an evening, um, on a particular evening, maybe, you know, totally relatable. And we should, you know, we should feel like we can reach out when we, when we need that. And, but I think if it's all the time and that it was all the time, it was that, that evening you're describing was every single evening to me. Um, that was, 
yeah, that was a death sentence. And look, I think we should all be able to spend a boring Monday evening comfortably alone and have the resources in us. And when I realized that, uh, for instance, in the, in the wake of my breakup, I was going and spending time sleeping on friends' sofas. Um, honestly, I think I, I think I literally did a sort of circulation of all my friends in London at one point, genuinely because I hated sleeping alone. Um, and I was like, I surely must have a better capacity for that. Mm. Um, and I, I think that I realized that, you know, it's, it's not, I'm all for, I think that, you know, our friendships do really determine the quality of our lives. And I, you know, I'm all for having brilliant relationships, but I, I want to come to those relationships with my best energy, not just because I, I need them. I want to come to them because I want them. And I think it was that state of neediness that I wasn't liking. And I think the fact that, cause I, I have actually haven't touched on dating apps yet, but I feel like the, the fact that you can you can sit there with the choice of watching a movie you really wanted to see or I don't know, devoting 20% of your brain to that movie and the other 80% to, I don't know, Tim, 34 from, I don't know, from, from Clapham and, and, you know, chatting to him all evening, having some subpar conversation. I think the fact that I was always making that latter choice or, you know, the choice of seeing a friend, even if I'd sort of roped them into it and it was a bit inconvenient for them and, it was a bit last minute or, you know, and I, I was a bit tired or whatever. I realized that like, I, I, I want to be bringing the best energy to my friendships and my, you know, I guess, you know, my relationships, my prospective relationships, how, how much time and energy can I devote to these social relationships? Not all of it. And, you know, if that's the case, how am I going to balance this out? You know, how am I going to, feed myself my need for connection for flow for joy for whatever without having other people there all the time without almost parasitically drawing this from those you know the, those 10 people I've texted to hang out with me you know and, and I, I think that it occurred to me I suppose I, I had been aware for most of I don't know most of a decade at that point, I think that I was an extrovert, you know, become familiar with that term in high school. I'd done, you know, the Myers-Briggs personality type that told me I was an extrovert. And I was like, right, well, I'm feeling this panic, this neediness, this, these aren't good emotions, right? So why has no one ever told me that this is the problem? Why is, why is everyone always patting me on the back and said, oh, like you're so great at these Yahoo networking events or, oh, you, you know, you're so much more sociable. Um, you know, you're so good at walking into parties alone. Um, why has everyone socially applauded me for that, but never said to me, hey, the fact that you can't spend time alone without, you know, honestly sitting on five different devices, going out on a terrible date and I don't know comfort eating biscuits or whatever like why why is that why why is that you know sure, surely that's something you should probably address where did the concept of alonement come from that's a, that's a nice word yeah, yeah yeah so I mean I don't know if you've ever had to go on a first date and tell someone that you're like you love spending time alone but it's a hard sell it's a really hard sell right yeah and um, <laughs> it's um I think that I, as again, my background in lifestyle journalism, we invent terms for things all the time. You know, we are responsible as a, you know, as a people for, you know, for ghosting, for snowflaking, for benching, for all these oh, terrible okay. terms about, right. all these, <laughs> nice. maybe not, yeah, um, maybe not ghosting. Maybe that was an actual psychologist, but most, most of these, they do come from a lifestyle journalist making something up. And I thought, right, well, if there's something that increasingly is becoming important to me on my personal development journey, if there's something that I can't communicate to people, you know, I'm a wordsmith. Surely that's sort of my calling to invent one. Um, and so alonement, uh, that was on this now defunct blog post on this now defunct blog. That was the first term I used, um, back in January, 2019. And it was an afterthought, to be honest. I thought, eh, I've got no way of communicating this. So let's call it alonement. Um, and you know, there's a, there's like a sense of intentionality. I like to the word. It's, you know, alonement meant to be alone I kind of like it like yeah this the, you know you're sitting in the corner of a restaurant by yourself you're like I wasn't stood up this is alonement yeah, like exactly. it's great yeah <laughs> um and so yeah I, I guess you know it, it was it was the word I was using as shorthand to sort of me and my friends we were the only people involved in this 
personal development journey. Oh, you know, and and whoever followed that that blog back then. Um, and then, yeah, increasingly, I was like, no, this is this is working. This is this is the opposite to loneliness, and I needed that. You know, the the way I envision it, there's loneliness, there's alonement, and that is the spectrum. Um, and we, you know, I need to advocate every time to say no, this is alonement. And I, I know that people sometimes say. There's solitude. You can say solitude is the opposite to loneliness. It's not. We still have to qualify positive solitude. The, the root of the word solitude is still solace, which is loneliness. That there is no intrinsic power, positivity, um, and you know, sort of everyday application of the word solitude. It's it's just this thing that sort of philosophers do on rocks somewhere. You know, my alonement is talking about something that's not radical, that's not reserved to hermits or philosophers or writers it's 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 something that is universal and it's you know it's spending 10 minutes a day by yourself if 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 you want that that's all it has to be um so yeah it just became increasingly very important to have the language to describe that hmm. yeah i think that's that's great like i was i was just thinking people have always said i have, have often said to me that oh you know you, you should like be more comfortable spending time alone and stuff and i'd I, generally when I want to do something, I'll put a calendar block in my calendar. And I've always just like called it um, block or something like that. But now I was thinking that, oh, alonement, that's a, that's what, a, what a nice word. I love that. I could have some alonement, alonement tonight, alonement time <laughs> block over there. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Schedule it in. Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's something really powerful about naming a thing. Because when it, when it feels like it has a name, even if, even if the name is made up, then it gives it in your own mind a sense that th th this is a real and intentional thing. I'm not just sort of spending time by myself or whatever else you might write on said calendar block. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think we do it, so, you know, in relationships, we do it. We say we're going to block in quality time, right? Um, you know, one thing I think me and my ex had going on really well was a shared Google calendar um, where we'd block in quality time for each other. Um, he was also in the in the tech world, you might imagine, given <laughs> given that level of sort of, of structure. But yeah, and that is how we made sure that that time for our relationship happened. And it had never occurred to me that I don't know, I think often we when we when we put in alone time, it's like when we um I don't know if you've ever seen that um, thought experiment where you'll put um, things, you'll put blocks into a jar, you'll put stones into a jar, and you'll put all of that in. Um, you know, put heavy heavy rocks first, and the little pebbles, and then you'll pour in the silt that is the sand. And in this analogy, the the alone time is often the you know it's the it's the um, I'm I'm now questioning whether silt and sand are different, but anyway, it's the very small particles of something that will fit around the big rocks, which are your relationships which are your work and I think that often that means that either it doesn't happen or it happens on a very low quality level so you think oh well you know I hate alone time alone time is the evening where you know I got cancelled on and I had nothing to do so I sort of you know heated up like a pot noodle or whatever like that's you know I think if we give time to something if we schedule something in you know and again we know this for anyone trying to improve uh, you know, a relationship, a friendship, or whatever will make that time for it. Will make it quality time. And I think if you're putting in those blocks of alonement into into your calendar, um, I mean, you know, I do it. I do it. I do it in yellow because that's you know, yellow and blue are the alonement colors. And I sort of I have that time in now, and it's it's nice because even I, you know, I need to remember to do it. Otherwise, you're sort of planning your week ahead, and you're doing it from that state of panic, like, oh my god, what if I'm alone? And like, no, no. If I'm alone, I will make that into quality time for me. And that's something I can look forward to equally. It's not the sort of low level silt that fits around, it fits around everything else. So in the book, you, you talk about kind of being alone by yourself, being alone in a relationship, being alone when living with other people. Um, I wonder if we can start by diving into being alone by yourself. Like what are some practical things that someone listening to this or me as well might, might take away to I guess spend like better quality time with ourselves compared to just like scrolling Twitter while watching TV while like e eating a pot noodle. Yeah, yeah, um, and completely. I think that's you know you're describing what alone time can be for so many of us all the time. And I think that basically, I again, you know, thinking about the whole, it's socially applauded to be an extrovert. We're encouraged to be extroverts, that kind of thing. I realized that social skills um, are actually built into the curriculum. 
when you're in, you know, sort of key stage one, key stage two, you, it's literally built into your curriculum to um, learn to play in a team, all of that. Um, you know, it's, it's the reason that often like homeschool kids come out super intelligent, but not necessarily having developed those things that they really do make sure they teach you at school. Solitude skills are the opposite to social skills. Solitude skills are the skills you need to be able to spend time comfortably alone. They're not on the curriculum. No one teaches you them. And you, you might be a natural, uh, a natural introvert and that they might come naturally to you. It might, you know, have always been your favorite thing to sit and read a book. And so, you know, this might, you know, these things might seem obvious to you, but I know for many of us, they're not. Um, and so you know, the solitude skills that I, concentrate on um you know firstly obviously you mentioned planning planning is so important i think just putting that time in to begin with um so making sure every week you've you've planned some time so you've got a sense of intentionality around it to begin with um it's not again that state of panic um i think so there's you know there's the scheduling i think and then there's the, the planning the intricate planning of like what am i going to do because psychologically we all love to have things to look forward to i think there was a study once about holidays that the well-being the well-being benefit from going on holiday actually begins two weeks before the holidays mm. in that build-up um so i think it's you know scheduling something specifically that you're excited about in your alone time for instance you know case in point i have known this whole week that tonight is going to be my free evening um you know i know the book i'm going to read um i know what i'm going to cook i've got you know i've got lots of like fresh ingredients in um in the fridge and i, I i'm looking forward to that time um but i wouldn't have been if i'd been cancelled on last minute and i didn't know what i was doing um so i think you know having the solitude skills to know okay i need to preempt this time to make it good it's important um, and I think, you know, also, and this is something that we found really difficult, I think, during the pandemic, it's being able to balance one's need for social time with solo time. So that might sound like an odd solitude skill, but honestly, I think that solitude has to exist in a framework where we are comfortably alone. Even as a, as a child, there was, a, you know, a, a child psychologist, uh, Donald Winnicott, famously, he wrote a paper on how to be alone and how to be alone as a baby that begins with knowing that there's a caregiver in sight um we're actually trying to train my mum's dog at the moment to do this so the dog needs to know you know the dog's only able to be by by herself for 15 minutes without company so she starts whining and scratching she needs to know that you're there so i think even as you know even as uh, kind of you know growing up adults we need to know that we've got the close relationships in our lives or that you know if we're spending this night alone we've got something nice planned at the weekend where we're going to check in and have a good chat with our best friend or our family or whatever it's being able to anticipate that and have it in the back of your mind having that grounding that you can then be able to sit there by yourself thinking okay this is good you know I've, I've got the balance in my life um so you know those are just a few things that we have um I think that the other one um I sort of talked about before with journaling is emotional regulation. So if you're by yourself and you've got no capacity to be calm, grounded, then you're, you're going to hate it. You're going to think, oh, like I, I've got no way of dealing with my thoughts when there aren't other people here. You know, either I rant to my friends or I, you know, I, whatever it's away and, and I, and this isn't a mode that I'm comfortable with. So you're going to want to avoid that at all costs. So I think that, you know, first and foremost, you need to build something into your life that is like, yeah, that is journaling or like, you know, a t five, 10 minute meditation. There are so many apps now. Um, you know, I do mine on like calm every morning. I do like the 10 minute calm app. You know, Tamara Levitt is my spirit animal at this point who does the meditations. Um, I think that you you need to sort of whatever that is for you you know some, for some people that's just going on a you know on a long walk or whatever you need to know that you can get to that state of like decompressing first before anything because otherwise it's just sort of yeah you're just throwing yourself into the pit of snakes that is your own mind and uh, you know I just I, I, I you know I say this because I was the worst at it because I was um, and still you know and I think it is so bloody uncomfortable and I think that so often when we're talking about personal development it needs to not be this lovely. I don't know, thing that looks very Instagrammable and, you know, that that is so easy to get to. It, it's hard. And I think that the more the more we talk about how 
the, you know, getting to that state of emotional regulation, these practices are quite hard and difficult to start with fundamentally. The more it's then it seems accessible, I think, because, you know, being alone is hard. You know, we're, we're tribal creatures and we're, 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 you know, we've got this sense of this primitive sense of primal sense of wanting to be part of a pack. And we're then thrust into an existence where we, you know, our whole primary school education is basically around how to work in a team. It's not natural. But I think the more we build these solitude skills in, the more we then can reap the benefits of both solitude and social time. So um, let's say I've got this block of alonement in my calendar. And actually, it turns out one of our podcast guests for this evening has just cancelled, which has now made me weirdly excited because now I can stretch out my alonement time to be from 7 p.m. rather than from 9 p.m. So I've got my alonement time in my calendar today, and I am now looking forward to it for the rest of the day. What should I be doing in my alonement time? Do I like sit there and do nothing, or like, every, like, what's, what, what would you recommend? <laughs> well, it depends what kind of person you are. I mean, some people are brilliant at doing nothing, and I really, you know, I kind of take my house off to them like that. I, you know, I think if you can just relax and I don't know, maybe listen to some music, but you know, just generally be a bit chill with an, in and in and of yourself. Brilliant personally never been that kind of person and i think that you know it, it's if you have if if you feel the need to sort of be be busy or have like accountability to your to your time um it's just thinking about what motivates you so like what you know what you would do on holiday is usually a good way of managing it i think that i hear about a lot of people who for instance can't read fiction or listen to podcasts mm. or whatever unless they're on holiday so i guess it's just bringing a bit more of that intrinsic sort of you know guilt-free you know what would i do mm. if i could fill these hours just how i wanted and plan that in um you know, but it is it is very independent to yeah to, to the individual and i think so often we sort of uh like we, we we think about the shoulds um or you know i actually I, you know i have it one way i used to think that an evening by myself would be like binge watching a series because like I always saw you know on Instagram like the thing is like oh like you know just just chilling by myself with popcorn in front of a series and I had this really weird revelation where I was like I feel weirdly lonely when I'm by myself watching a TV series mm. like movies are fine because there's an ending and you're like okay that's all wrapped up into a narrative but like TV series they just go on and on and so like for me I'm like okay I'm gonna either watch a movie or read a book um you know but for you it, you know it might be you know maybe it's it's being active maybe it's doing you know that stuff that you don't feel like you get get enough time to get around to in the day whatever whatever it is that you feel like you've been putting off in favor of yeah work or you know other people or whatever um it's yeah it's bringing that holiday mindset into it i guess so yeah or like you know whatever you know culturally you sort of saved to to watch or it can help to i try and always keep like a movie list on my phone so i like i'm not when i come to that time by myself I'm like hey i'm gonna watch that really weird cult film that no one else wanted to watch with me or um like almost preempting these mm. kind of spontaneous times of alone time that you've got coming up yeah does does playing video games count as alonement? Absolutely, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's great, and that's uh, video games are great because it's it's flow as well. You sort of get absorbed into it, um, and you you sort of you're using your hands. I think that there's we you know we are all a bit addicted to yeah to to being on our phones. So I think anything that can sort of replicate that um, and isn't about I mean you look video games are addictive in their own way, right? But they're a nice sort of mindless way to react to relax rather and i think it's not about reacting to yeah whatever weird thing you see on social media i think it's almost like i don't know i mean look talk me through because i don't really i don't play video games but i kind of i, I feel like i quite appreciate what that's like i mean does you know do you find like your your thoughts are just your own there or is it you just absorbed in the game yeah so i used to be big into video games when i was younger and then when i got to university i sort of ended up prioritizing other things and I've always kind of thought, well, for, for ages that, you know, I, I, I used to really enjoy my time playing video games and I kind of wish I had more time for it or made more time for it. But then I always think, yeah, but it's not, it's not particularly productive. And yeah. like, I could learn a song on the guitar instead, which I know would probably bring me more fulfillment, or I could do some journaling or I could do some writing or I could, yeah, do almost like I, I could read a fiction book, uh, 
which to me feels sort of the equivalent of playing video games because there are, you know, there's often this like snobbery between like, oh, video games, bad reading, good. Um, and sometimes what I think is like, you know, just playing a really good single player fantasy role playing game, video game. How does that compare to reading a really good fantasy series? And like one, like the book thing feels like, yeah, I read a book tonight. I'm, I'm great. Video game kind of feels like I played a video game tonight. What's wrong with me? Like I'm a loser kind of vibes, but I feel like that's probably just in my head. Um, and so, uh, yeah, not sure how I, how, how I feel about video games in that sense. So funny. Yeah. I think I always, I always think back to actually when, um, when, when there weren't any video games, you know, back in like the you know, sort of Victorian era, <laughs> like I remember there was a big thing about, um, no, uh, novels written by women. Novels written by men were okay, but novels written by women, they were probably seen in, seen in the same, like, you know, trivial sort of, you know, guys really? as we see in video games oh, now. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's like, oh, like these women <laughs> filling their heads with trash. Like, I think it was really amazing to imagine that was seen culturally as exactly the same as like binge yeah. watching a series or playing a video game. So mm. I think, yeah, culturally we put all these, you know, weird rules around ourselves. Um, but I don't know if you've ever found, you know, because I've had this, when you you have an evening in by yourself and you you think all this lofty th stuff. Like, you know, for me, I spent hard, I say half of lockdown. I, I think I spent most of lockdown trying and failing to play the piano. And so often, you know, if I had an evening in by myself, which, you know, let's face it, living alone during lockdown, that was a relentless situation. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to learn, you know, I'm going to practice a song on the piano tonight. I probably wouldn't get around to that. So my alone time probably would be spent on Instagram because I was so much dreading it. I think sometimes, you know, there is like that. I mean, we don't even need to put a hierarchy here, do we? But there is that middle ground where like, if you're doing something for you, then any, anything is better than social media. Um, and I think that also when we talk about enjoyment, um, there's that classic, um, there's that distinction between like hedonic so like you know the things that are short-term gratification whatever and then oh what's the word eudaimonic i think is the is the i think aristotle used to use um eudaimonic happiness that like longer term fulfilling gratifying which is you know for you learning a song on the, the piano for me sorry on the guitar for me failing to learn a song on the piano um um the, both of those things should be I'm saying should a lot, but both. it would be nice to think that we can do both of those things when we're alone as well as when we're with other people. Because, um, you know, alone time effectively, we're saying, look, I am enough to spend time with. And that, they could, that can be all sorts of things. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if the distinction is then sort of just being kind of inten intentional about it. Because if I think of back in my video gaming days, it's like, it was just the, the, the default thing I would do, get home from school, just turn on World of Warcraft and just mindlessly play that for hours and hours and hours. Sometimes having like Grey's Anatomy in the background or something like that. And it was never like a intentional thing. It, like, and I think it's, it's almost like scrolling Twitter these days or scrolling social media. It's like you sit on the sofa, you get your phone out, your thumb finds itself just like, you know, autopiloting to Twitter or Instagram and then scroll, 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 scroll. And for me, I find that when I stop to think, do I actually really want to be on Twitter right now? The answer is usually, no, probably not. There's something else I actually want to do. Um, and I think that's what my relationship with video games was like back in the day. Whereas today, given that that's not a default for me, I could decide tonight in my little alonement time, I could go out and watch a film. I haven't seen the new Batman one. That could be good. I could play a video game. I haven't started Elden Ring. That could be good could go to a restaurant by myself and just do some journaling that could be fun so i've got all these things that i feel like oh all three of these would actually be like solid options or even just like going home and doing the laundry nah that's boring i'll do that tomorrow instead <laughs> yeah so those three feel like feel like exciting options and i feel like i'm looking forward to this evening spent by myself now yeah absolutely and even being able to make that judgment call and to sit and have that like it feels yeah, it feels wonderfully like indulgent, like thinking, oh, like here are all my options, you know. And you wouldn't feel if you're planning a you know a special night for a significant other or for a friend yeah. or whatever, you wouldn't think, oh, I'm being so indulgent by weighing up my options. But you know, it's like there's something delicious about being able to yeah. do that when it's your own alone time. And yeah, as you say, it's that intentionality. I think that so often we'll look up from our phones, and you know, it's not our fault. Our phones are these incredibly you know genius addictive 
pieces of you know of, that we of, you know these devices that we have in our pocket and i think we need to be very aware from that of that i don't think you know i think people like Carl newport are doing so much wonderful work in highlighting that so yeah i you know i think we should be a little bit afraid of our phones almost how much they can make the compelling argument for something that we don't intend to do mm. But yeah, it's really nice to think. Um, and you, you know, you mentioned the cinema as well. That's also really it. It takes it takes, I guess, the solitude skill, which I kind of didn't mention earlier, of being good at being alone in public. Um, but once you do, that's one of the purest, best, most sighted amongst yeah. my audience forms of alonement that you can get. Yeah, yeah. I just dis I discovered the joy of going to the cinema solo a, a few years ago. I think I'd. Like the like Avengers Endgame was coming out, but like I hadn't seen Captain Marvel or something. I was like, I need to watch Captain Marvel. I asked a few friends, hey, do you want to go to cinema? And they were like, nah, I'm busy for various reasons. And I finished work that day. This was when I was still in medicine. I was like, I could, I could just go by myself. And I went by myself, got some popcorn, had a great time. Didn't have to discuss it with anyone afterwards. <laughs> so now I'm just like, I love going to the <laughs> cinema by myself. Because <laughs> you can just literally sit there and watch the film without having, without feeling any sense of social obligation in the slightest. Yeah, yeah. And especially, I, I mean, I, I think we all have those friends that we, adore but um do tend to be the people that make comments during movies or theater things and and yeah. then you're, you're sitting there you're like oh like i shut up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a shut up b <laughs> yeah you feel a bit embarrassed and you're just so immersed you and the thing mm. like, there's such a purity to that experience i have never lived alone what's that what's that like some people tell me i should i should practice it but i, I always find myself ending up with housemates and i always feel like uh, i feel like living with some with other people is just generally a bit more fun um yeah what's what's living alone like would you recommend it yeah um very very nuanced and it's been very i mean it's been three three four years for me now um so you know the the um the slight gray area when my ex was living with me for a bit but i there have been times where i've loved it um and there have been times, you know, during the pandemic, for instance, living alone, being alone all the time just doesn't stand up. Um, I do think you can, you can only speak personally. I do think for me, it's been an experience where I've really learned to, I guess, listen to and identify my needs. But I think I was someone that wasn't very able to do that in the first place around other people. Um, I think, you know, some people do grow up and they're naturally you know assertive and able to say okay you know I need a bit of space for myself or you know oh you know I'd quite like to I don't know I quite like kitchen counters to be really tidy and uncluttered or what you know whatever like whatever your thing is that makes you feel comfortable and grounded and and, and I've had to learn I think to practice that while, while living alone um I was never really, I don't know, I, I, I would lose myself quite often. And I find this in big group dynamics, particularly if you're living lose yourself? in a house. I lose myself. I lose a sense of what I want. And even on a big group holiday, sometimes I lose a sense of, I, you know, I sometimes don't even know what I want for breakfast because I look to what the person next to me is having. Mm. Um, I'm very, I think it's maybe the extrovert it's part of my personality. It's like maybe a sort of like an empathy, but to a fault. Um, I've always struggled with that. I'm not quite sure why as a person, but I think that um, living alone has been a space for me where I've been able to gain a much better sense of uh, of selfhood. But, you know, talk to me when I'm living inevitably with other people or another person, you know, in, in the future, I'll have to adjust. I think there are all sorts of skills. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe for some, the greater skill is learning to, you know, be a great housemate, a great partner, be a great person to live with. If, you know, if that's the way that you're going to spend most of, of your life, I don't know. I, I, all I can, I suppose, say is like, personally, I've benefited from that period of my life, but like, I wouldn't necessarily advocate that everyone has to do it. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that some people listening to this who are maybe not millennials and Gen Zs might feel like, this obsession with me, like, what do I want, et cetera, et cetera, is all a bit like misguided because really, you know, back in our, back in the day, it was less about what do I want and more about how do I serve the collective and the community and all the family and family values and all, the, all that kind of stuff. How do you feel about this balance between kind of uh, acknowledging the self versus surrendering the idea of the self and like surrendering to the community and to the collective and to the, the family and all that stuff? 
it's funny. Um, I think that we often think we have to choose one or the other. And I think that's where a lot of the guilt around alone time comes from. I think it's, you know, you feel that um, parents often feel that they have to be around for, you know, for their children all the time and always think about their children's needs above their own always. Um, and I think that what gets forgotten, you know, in that example, for instance, is that if, you know, A, you're not going to be the best person for your child if you are stressed and frenetic and you, if you deny yourself the things that you need to decompress, you know, even if that's 10 minutes having a cup of tea in the morning, you you will in, inevitably that will come out. Um, so even you know, if your end goal is to be a good parent, being selfless is not going to help anyone. Um, because if you don't advocate for your needs, you know, your five-year-old, your five-year-old kid is not going to do that for you. You, you need to parent yourself as well. Um, and you know, I think parents are realizing this increasingly as well, that there, there, there is that need, but, but still, I think the other element of that is that, um, you know, in this, you know, okay, I'm using the example of parenting here, but I think generally, if you don't model looking after your own needs, then your child is not going to learn that. Um, I think that, you know, for me, you know, say I grew up not ever being told I needed to spend time alone. Um, but I did see my mother who is naturally an introvert. She's one of the people that my book makes no sense to because she's like, you yeah, know, duh. <laughs> <laughs> she, I remember seeing her, she gets up at six in the morning to go and have breakfast by herself and do her yoga and do her crossword. And um, it's just, it's, and I, I know, you know, I, I know I'll come down and she'll be the most calm and grounded and happy than ever on those days. And I think that growing up and watching someone be okay in their own company, um, okay, it didn't immediately come through. This is why I was <laughs> way too scared to do it. But definitely it was, a, it was a role model. It was a reference point for them me to be able to do it. And I think we do, you know, we can role model it for each other. I think that recently I went on holiday with a couple of friends and we all had slightly different sort of holiday aims. I think, you know, one of one of uh, them was a bit, was one of those people who's very good at relaxing. She has a very high powered, very stressful job. But when she's, when she's on holiday, she will sit by the pool and she will read and she is brilliant. And I think that we could all learn a lot from, from her. Um, you know, my other friend um, was, you know, she had quite a bit of work to do. Um, and, you know, for me, I was sort of, I, uh, you know, as I say, I'm this hyperactive puppy when I get up in the morning and, you know, I go for my run, I go for breakfast, whatever. Anyway, we were all doing all different things, but the fact that we were, and we came together a lot as well. We had a lot of time together, but the fact that we were able to be a bit me, me, me for, you know, an hour or two of the day and it allowed us to have a better holiday, to meet all of our needs, but also to allow each other to do it. I think it was like alonement can quite often be a mutually agreed upon value within you know whether that's within a marriage whether that's within a sort of you know parent child dynamic where you learn to be comfortable reading in each other's company uh, you know whether that's in the community mm. you know we see even in religious communities we see uh, we you know retreat into into prayer and we we allow ourselves to sort of be alone together communally um i think that we can I think that it's absolutely a necessary value alongside having community values, you know, having alonement. And I think the uh, modeling that for each other and allowing us, you know, each other to do it without imposing a sort of guilt or, yeah. you know, narcissism on top of it. Actually, it, it can be really, it can be really catching and actually underpins us all being better to one another. Hmm. One of, one of the things I used to have on my hinge profile was the, pr the the prompt was um the ideal relationship is when dot 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 and i i wrote something like when we spend 10 percent of our time each day together and the rest of the time kind of doing our own thing and i had some that that, that was a very controversial thing to say i had some people being like I mean, 10% of 24 hours, 2.4 hours, I mean, sounds reasonable, possibly, <laughs> possibly a bit excessive. And I had other people being like, oh my God, what a fucking sociopath, psychopath. I, how, how, how dare he suggest you want to be in a relationship where you're only spending 10% of your time like together. And my mind was thinking like two and a half hours a day, it's a long time to spend like <laughs> with someone quality time. Like surely you want to like kind of do your own thing and read your own book and not feel the need to have all this time kind of together, together. Um, 
what's your take on kind of in a, in the context of a relationship, this balance between hanging out versus not hanging out? I think, uh, yeah, you know what? When you actually pan that down to 10% is 2.4 hours, that makes sense. I mean, I think it's, it's really funny because you see 10%, you think, oh, that's nothing. But I... I think the, the crux is quality time, right? I like, I love the idea of my, my romantic fantasy is like reading a book on the opposite end of a sofa to someone else also reading their own book, you oh, know? Yeah. Like, that's great. <laughs> and someone who's spent, you know, it's spent a lot it's of time. A dream, yeah. yeah I, but like the idea of alone togetherness, that comfort, that, you know, coming back to that Donald Winnicott child psychologist thing of like being comfortable in the presence of another without needing to interact. Um, I, I think that you know, that's maybe the gray area. That's maybe the, you know, maybe that's the 20% that we're not, of the waking hours that aren't being accounted for in that 10%. Yeah. There's, there, there, there is a gray area there. But quality time, I think is, is so important because I think, uh, and people have different approaches with dating, but for some, and I think this can be driven by insecurity quite a lot. There's this sense that you should be checking in every hour or so, hour or two on WhatsApp. That's my personal hell. I, I, you know, WhatsApp, so much stuff gets misconstrued. Me and my best friend in the world, we, you know, we, yes, we'll WhatsApp. And when, honestly, we sometimes get, you know, occasionally one of us will send each other a WhatsApp late at night and we'll get into this like frenetic, great, energetic conversation. But we don't, I, you know, I, I, we do not message each other asking, how was your day? Because yeah. we know that our bond is so great, that our energy together, our quality time is so much better than this weird green app that's pinging and, you know, in, in between our hinge notifications and our like, you know, Instagram or whatever. Like we know that it's more than that. So we don't want to reduce it. So I think, you know, I think that maybe it's an easier sell and it's, it's hard because, you know, hinge like Twitter gives you what well, in those prompts, um, text boxes, it gives you like a, a small amount of characters and you know, also no one wants to, a nuanced essay on a hinge profile anyway, but <laughs> it, you know, there, there is so much yeah. more to it. There is so much more to it. Um, and I think, you know, in the same way that we, we can make alone a time, quality time, I think it's made me so much more passionate about my friendships and my time with others being really really good like I'm I think again when it's not just like you know you're not just sort of like lazily reaching for someone to kind of just you know be with you to quell your existential fear of dying then it's really nice to you know know that you're gonna actually value that that yeah. time so yeah I don't know I think it's it I can never I can totally see why it was a hard sell but I think that in a relationship <laughs> yeah it's just it's it, it's it's just communicating that value yeah isn't it yeah, well, one thing that my my girlfriend and I kind of distinguish between is together, together time and together alone time. Oh, so you have that? Yeah. So like together alone is where we're chilling in the same on, on the dining table doing our own work or right. reading our own books or like doing our own thing. And together, together time is when we're actually together, together doing a thing or like spending quality time with one another. And I like, I like really like it when it's skewed more in the together alone camp yeah. of like, we're in the same room, we're enjoying each, each other's company, but we're doing our own thing. And then the time that we do spend together is like intentionally there and we're intentionally present. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I, you know, I've been in kind of a handful of shorter relationships in the time, you know, post, post alonement era the past three years, but getting it right in the relationship, I think it's absolutely magic. Cause I think quite often people think about this concept in terms of being single and look, some people want to be single for life and that's a completely brilliant you know in some ways delicious life experience I, most people don't so the gold standard i suppose is getting that value into a relationship so you know well done to begin with how, how do you and how but how do you keep that balance going so that can be a difficult one right if you i know, I know you're probably yeah. not as cutthroat as the 10 percent these days but yeah i mean so we don't live together so that makes it fairly, fairly straightforward um often if we are on holiday we will kind of plan out like okay today we're going to have like the morning after breakfast we're going to do co-working until 3 p.m which basically means <laughs> sitting on our respective laptops doing our own thing and then we'll go on this like th thing we'll, we'll go out for dinner we'll go on this cruise we'll, like whatever um and so having those like co-working blocks is like there's basically that together alone time um once we start living together at some point maybe post-marriage uh then i'm sure it'll become a trickier balance where you are in each other's company all the time mm -hmm. i guess yeah. yeah, I think that that is, I, yeah, it's because it's been so long that I don't, I can't quite imagine what that like incidental time with a partner would be. Um, 
I don't know. But I guess it's it's just going in with the values. And I think that that is, it's, 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 it's almost why it's important to have these, like these harder conversations early on, I suppose, because then you're going, then you're at least, you know, it, it, it almost happens more naturally because you're like, okay, well, okay. It's, it's go like we, alone time is a value. Therefore it will come yeah. at some point during today or, um, how are you about, so I, I get very awful with my, I, cause I, I work in a co-working space. So mm. I'm, I'm kind of quite often around others when I'm working. I'm not very good at being distracted. It's the flow that I really look for, especially when I'm writing. How do you, how do you get the balance with that? Because there's so, there's such a tendency to chat, isn't there? When you're yeah. sort of alone together, okay, working. Yeah. Uh, I find noise cancelling headphones with, <laughs> oh. with the, the Lord of the Rings soundtrack or like film music to be my jam where I literally can't hear anything. And so if someone wants to get my attention, I have to like wave at me. Hmm. Um, and so that's my, my way of doing it in co-working spaces and stuff. That's great. Um, I, yeah. I, um, I always remember near AL's um, wife apparently wears a, a productivity helmet or something, or productivity <laughs> crown. She wears like a, I think it's like a, a hairband, like a yeah. tiara or something. She's fashioned with like lights on it to to show when she's busy, but um, and not to be distracted. But I think that, um, yeah, I mean, noise cancelling headphones, they, they've got that up over and above AirPods, haven't they? Because they're very much a sort of giant yeah. F off sign. Yeah, you know, in the exactly. possible way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I really like co-working spaces. I think I, I get a lot of energy from being like in a library or in a co-working space with other people doing their own thing, hmm. as long as I don't have to talk to them <laughs> necessarily. And like one of the nice things about this office here is that people are around, but also I've heard that <laughs> like I get way less done when I'm here than when I'm just in a coffee shop by myself. Because the tent, like, there's always just like, oh, having a chat about something or other, and there's always something happening. Um, but I guess the, the way I think about it is, you know, when I when I reflect on this year or when I, I reflect on like my my twenties, having a team and stuff, will I be thinking, oh damn, I wish I had more time for deep work, or or will I be like, you know what, I'm really glad we had all those conversations. And it's probably the conversations that I'll be glad for. That's um, so interesting. Yeah, I um I went to um a. I went. I went to see Rupi Kaur last night, the poet. Um, and you imagine a poetry reading is a you sort of tiny thing in a cafe. It was not. It was, she's it like was huge. She's yeah. huge, huge. Yeah, and it was this huge venue. We were at the Barbican. Yeah. In this sort of big space, and it was it was like a rock concert. It was insane. <laughs> um, but one, it's reminding me of one of the poems that she read, where she effectively said, "It's amazing that, you know, with it was it was on productivity. It's with productivity, but so often we think, okay, I can't, I can't, you know." call up my mum or I can't, you know, engage with my partner. I can't do this and that because it's taking me away from my dream. Like, but surely like being able to do that in the first place, being able to call your mum, being able to engage with your partner, that's the dream in and of itself. And yeah. You know, it just yeah. really got to me. I was like, must call mum. <laughs> yeah. I, I often have this thought process, like, and, and I think I've become good at, at recognizing this, that whenever I'm making a choice between work and something social, I pause and think, how, like, what does me in the future think of this decision? So like yesterday, my grandma called me just before I was about to record a video. And I only had like 15 minutes to record the video. And I was like, fuck the video. Like, let's, <laughs> let's talk, let's talk to my grandma. I think, I think similarly at, at university, one, one piece of advice I got from the student room before going to uni was that you should buy a doorstop. And I bought a doorstop and I would just always have my door propped open. And that was, I think, one of the best purchases I'd, I'd ever made because it made my room like the wel a welcoming environment for people to just come in and hang out. And like w when I think back to my university experience, I'm so glad of all of the serendipitous encounters that happened because my door was open, even if I got an, I got two percent less in the exam because like I was a bit less focused. And so I often think of like, yeah, what 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 really matters here? Because like I guess as as type A worky type people it's too easy to default to work and it's the thing we have to be intentional about is actually making time for ourselves making time for our relationships and our health absolutely um i should have taken your advice at university i um i had a hilariously heuristic experience in that i i think i completely like i got there i was like, i was absolutely determined to get first i was like i'm not going to be a sociable person at uni i'm not gonna have any fun you know work 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 I missed out on my first by half a percent, which oh. means, which make, which means like it, it makes like no difference. It means I've got the same, you know, the same mark as my person who, I mean, my friend who sat next to me and had loads of fun. And I, I didn't, 
I, it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered either way. Um, and I look back and I, I realize now increasingly my attitude towards work is like, I don't, I don't think that fun and work are dichotomous. Like I used to think that they were, I think I got in my head so often growing up that like, you would have to, you know, you you could only get a first by not having any fun. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I didn't do either, <laughs> um, but, which is hilarious. But like I, you know, and and, and I used to think that they they didn't um, go together. But actually, I think you know, especially when you're when you're working in you know the space that we talk about, you know, personal development, you know, how to have a good life, how to have a balanced life, you need to do it yourself. You know, you can't just think productive, productive. Um, and, you know, it's and it's so odd to think that, I don't know if it's something that was instilled in us, you know, by our parents, if there's this, this sense of sort of guilt or, you know, that we didn't used to discuss ambition in a sort of holistic 360 sense, you know, which included things like work-life balance and fun. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm glad of the revelation. Um, you know, it's... That I guess that's one version of having it all, really, isn't it? Like having those relationships and having, mm -hmm. and yeah, and you, yeah, as you say, you look back, and I think that again, you know, having you know all the amazing things that you've achieved in your career, and you know, I'm sure you kind of look back and think there are so many. Those are, things are great in and of themselves, but they're very quickly metabolized. Um, you know, the end is there, there is no end to these things, so uh, nothing is worth it in a way, which is, which is good when you realize that nothing is worth it because yeah. nothing is lasting, then you might as well nurture those relationships, have that fun. Yeah. Yeah. And like everyone, everyone talks about this, like, but it's, it's, a, it's a, such a thing that I find so useful to get like almost daily reminders of that, you know, it's so easy to think that happiness is found on the next rung of the ladder. Mm. And like, oh, I'm going to work really hard today. And then like dot, 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 that promotion, that whatever. And I was listening to Steve Bartlett's interview with Lewis Capaldi last night in my kind of pseudo alone time where I was just sort of scrolling YouTube. I just happened to sort of fast forward to a timestamp. And what Lewis Capaldi was saying was that like, the thing he's realized, you know, his first album became like stupidly successful. But he's realized that like, this is it, like there is no next milestone. And shit, you know, you actually can just live life like that, like really fully enjoying the present moment, mm -hmm. rather than deferring happiness to when dot 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 happens. And I guess, you know, the counter to that is always, you know, people who are who are struggling who are like, well, for me, it it genuinely is happiness when I get that promotion because now I can feed the family. And like, you know, you know, I, I think outside of that, basically everyone everyone I know who is like way above the poverty line, which is basically everyone I know, continues to strive for that next thing, and it's very easy to go too much in that direction and not remember that actually this is it like the the you know journey before destination and all that kind of stuff yeah i do i mean do you think it's it's it i mean i was i was i was about to say do you think it's social media but i i, I wonder if it's something in the human psyche to always want more sort of almost that's mm -hmm. aggravated by social media you know i think that we look I think it's nice to have goals, right? And, you know, for me, I, it was a really great purpose-driven thing that there was this message about alone time that I wanted to get out. And I think I said to myself, if I do something every single day to get that message out a bit, even if that's, you know, cold emailing someone or, you know, making a podcast episode or whatever, then that I'll be, you know, or even just responding to a message on Instagram, that will be a bit further towards my goal. Um, but I think that we look on social media and we're just affronted with all these shoulds of what we should be doing. Like we are a, a thousand different lives, versions of success that we should have. And so I think it's satisfying in and of itself sometimes you know, to have a purpose and to feel, you know, to, to get that through, um, to get that across. But it can only really be something that you've, that you've set for yourself, you know, because other, other, otherwise it's just, you know, they're like arbitrary standards of success. You know, if it's someone else's, you know, if it's if it's an award that you're getting or, you know, a, a job that you're getting, like you don't really have much control about that. So I don't know, it's it's that that's not worth gambling happiness on. I think the you know, the purpose thing, I can totally see, you know, putting aside a drinking session so you can get up and, you know, write another like two hundred words on on your book project, fine. Um, but I I don't get it, you know, waking up to I don't know, yeah, to do something you know, for your boss who won't appreciate it anyway, that kind of thing. Mm. 
Yeah, like when we were chatting in the in, in the break, I think it was when the cameras were off about about like book writing and stuff. You said something like um, that with 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 book number one, you felt like you didn't take the time to enjoy the process, and that like really struck a chord with me because I think with a long project like that where there's clear goals and in a way where there's a deadline and you kind of want to give yourself even fake deadlines because otherwise it's it's easy to procrastinate from writing. Um, it's easy to forget that this is supposed to be fun. Yeah. And I often do forget that. And then I remind myself. And I'm like, oh yeah. And at one point, like I think I think it was in lockdown. I even had a post-it note on my computer screen saying, This is supposed to be fun. Where I was just like, <laughs> I, would, I would see that occasion be like, oh yeah, <laughs> it is. And actually just there's something about that reminder that's just yeah. like, oh, actually, this is supposed to be fun. And so, ah, who cares if I didn't bang out that extra two hundred words that I really wanted to bang out, you know, because my grandma called or something like that. Like, this is supposed to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, 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 I mean, I don't know where it comes from, this feeling that like this, this dichotomy that we have in our heads. I think almost sometimes there feels this, maybe it's the, maybe it's the sense of uh, guilt we find around doing anything that's for ourselves. Maybe there's a, a, you know, another level of guilt around doing something that's creative or that's, you know, fulfilling to our, you know, our own sort of sense of purpose that we don't, we don't feel it can also be fun on top of that like you know creating generally you know um and actually you know creativity is it's a it's it's a human need it's something yeah. that we you know we should all you know have in our lives whether that's you know whether that comes into our professional lives or not um and yeah and it can only um it comes across best if it's fun as well you know the people i see on the people that I, you know, enjoy following on, you know, on social media, on YouTube, listening to the podcast stuff, they're also having a really good time. You know, they're not just passionate. No one's, you know, dying for their art here. They're also just engaged and curious and interested. And those are things that we don't really factor in when we're thinking about, you know, the job we choose to take or the way we spend, spend our time sometimes. But they're, they're, that's living. You seem to have an allergic reaction to the word should. Can you? Tell me more about that. Should to me is, I think, I think it is, it's, it's all the extrinsic sort of motivations that we, that we internalize, right? So it's all the things that we grow up being told by a community that we should do, that we see on social media, that we have in our, you know, in our professional spheres, um, there are all these, you know, these tightly bound up versions of success that people outside of them don't even quite understand. Um, you know, medical world being a classic example, architecture, whatever. Um, and we are, you know, the, the only kind of commonality at the intersection of all these shoulds is us, you know, being affronted by them all. Um, no one else knows what we're being told from many different directions we're supposed to do, but we do. Um, and I think that because there's no way to, there's no necessary, there's not necessarily a support group for all the shoulds that we individually experience. You know, you can, you, yes, you can go to, you know, you can say, you can listen to, you know, for instance, I'm, you know, I'm from a Jewish background, so I can go and see a Jewish comedy and think, oh yeah, you do get a lot of pressure to get married early or whatever. So you can hear that, but no one can understand what it's like to be me as a, you know, a, someone who rose up in the magazine journalist world or, you know, someone who's um, Jewish but not religious and so on the cusp of that um, or, you know, someone who is a woman as well and, you know, and struggling with like lots of different, I don't know, lots of different ideas, lots of different opinions. And I think, you know, whenever, whenever we say I should do this, we're saying it it's not coming from us. It's not coming from our passions and our curiosities and our needs. It's coming from whichever one of these sources. And we are the only people that can interrogate in and of ourselves where that's coming from. We need to be so constantly aware of all the shoulds acting upon us. And I think that the shoulds, you know, something I am very allergic to is the idea of fear motivating our actions and fear and pressure and you know, guilt and all of those negative emotions, but mostly fear that we're not going to conform with the, you know, the should, the community, the pressure that we, that's being put on us. Um, and I think that we, 
the way to sort of override that is with our curiosities and our passions. And I think that that's from, that means transforming should into could, you know, I think that whenever you start a creative project, it's like, oh, I could do this. You know, I could have some fun with this. The world suddenly seems open and coming from inside you, not mm. the things that are weighing you down. So I guess, I suppose I'm very aware of my own shoulds and I'm very aware of any time someone says a statement with the should in it, because, you know, anyone who's had any degree of therapy of coaching should is a toxic, toxic word and it's no way to live a life. I love that. Yeah. Like I've, I think in, in the last year or so, I've also had started to develop an allergic response to the word should whenever I say it to myself or whenever someone says it to me, be like, oh, I, I know, I know I should do X. I'm like, ah, you know, there are no shoulds. Like, mm. what do you actually want to do here? Yeah. <laughs> and there's something about, again, take, taking that pause and recognizing that behind the word should is a really powerful, bad story we're probably telling ourselves. And we can reframe that to a could, and it, it, it could be exactly the same thing. Like I had, had this yesterday that, oh, I should, I should film this video today. And I'm, I, I was saying to these guys, just like, oh, I don't really feel like it. And Gordon was just like, oh, it's fine. You know, there's no need. Like we can just allow the video and just forget about it and always do it another time. And I was like, oh yeah, but I should do it now. And he was like, no, 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 like you're good. You don't need to do it right now. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're just like, in a way, just being reminded of that, I just think is, is, is super helpful. Um, yeah, I, I guess so, because I guess, you know, in the same way, you can, no one can understand all the shoulds um, that are, you know, pressuring you to do something, all the, you know, all the stories that you're telling yourself. I guess also voicing them to someone else, like it frees you a little bit. It frees you of that weird intersection of things pushing down on you yeah. by getting that sense of kind of outside perspective. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's very interesting what you do say about the stories that we tell ourselves as well. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other word change that I think is super helpful is like whenever I feel like I have to do something, I always try and change it to I get to do the thing. Um, and I often forget that this is a thing and I'm like, oh, I have to do the laundry. I have to like, I mean, whatever. And then occasionally I'll be like, no, wait, wait a minute. I get to do the laundry. I just like even just that change in attitude towards the laundry just changes the way I feel about it. And I do the laundry with a spring in my step. Hmm. It's just like a little mental change, which is so easy to forget in yeah. you know the hecticness of life, I guess. Completely. And I think, um, you know, even something like laundry, like I, I try and always reframe that actually, you know, having, I don't know, the washing machine was an incredible um, invention for, you know, housewives everywhere, you know, a hundred years ago when it honestly meant that it, you know, changed. I'm, I'm trying to remember when the when that would have actually realistically taken place. Yeah. That that <laughs> yeah. technological advancement. But anyway, whenever the washing machine came out, that literally you know halved people's sort of um, laundry load. And you know, having the privilege to be in a house where you can have clean clothes, use a washing machine. Yeah, it's all that. I think it also rises above the like um, the privilege conversation. It's like yeah, it's like actually even the mundane things that we do for ourselves. That's still sec uh, self-care in a very unsexy way but it is still self-care um and you know getting to look after ourselves to nurture ourselves is great you know same same with things like exercise i suppose oh i've got to go to the gym but like i get to go to the gym i get to look after myself um i really like that shift it's it's kind of like the fun thing but like an e even like a step a step further mm. yeah like it's a ch it's a choice and it's, there's always a choice yeah um Changing gears a bit. So your career now, I guess, career in inverted commas, like, is, you know, you've got you've got the book, freelance journalism, public speaking. You've got the online course. Uh, is uh, how do you describe what you do? And I guess how does that feel compared to back in the day when you had a job and a regular paycheck? <laughs> yeah, um, I really do struggle to describe what I do, to be honest. Um, I think that, you know, punctuation can help. I think lots of slashes and hyphens and whatnot. Um, and, you know, occasional quotation marks um, <laughs> um, can can really help. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, first and foremost, I think I said at the beginning uh, of this year, uh, you know, my podcast is the thing that has always kept the alonement conversation evolving. Um, you know, it's I, I'm lucky enough to work with a couple of sponsors on that, and it's being able to. I don't know. It's it's being able to. You know, yes, okay, know that that is now 
you know, it took me two years, but like, you know, it, it's now very much like a strand of my, you know, of my earnings. Um, but also to be able to have something I'm always going to bring the passion to, always bring the fun to. Um, so, you know, that, that, that has been, um, for this year, I think the sort of main, um, the job title that I'm gravitating towards most. Um, but then, you know, a lot of it, I, I was, you know, I say that I left magazine journalism. I've actually been working for, uh, Glamour magazine, one of the, um, you know, one, one of the biggest sort of names in magazine journalism when I was growing up. Um, for, you know, for over a year now, I'd, I've been doing their celebrity interviews on the side. So, you know, that's another strand. And that's something that I'm, you know, I, I am now getting to the point where I'm taking a step back and thinking about the next um, strain of my career. So, you know, that is, you know, I've got um, another writing project I've been working on for the past year i've got um a newsletter that you know should be starting in the that's a clue in the name there well, you know should be starting in the next um month or two i really i struggle to say because it is an evolving thing all i can say is i think a lot about it and i'm you know i'm always you know first and foremost like you know i, I i'm I guess wanting we'll to come back to, you know, what I started with, the, you know, the personal development space and helping empower others to do that. Um, and coming back to what I'm good at. I think when I, when I had written the book a couple of years ago and when I was first came out of that, I was like trying to do everything at once, spread myself really thin. And now I'm trying to lean into, you know, what my skill sets are, what my strengths are. Um, but, you know, if that does mean, for instance, you know, moving more towards a newsletter format rather than spending so much time on Instagram as a writer, you know, then so be it. It's just looking for those different avenues that you can then connect with an audience, spread that passion um, with. And, and yeah, and, you know, and, and for me, be a writer and communicator. Um, that's a very long winded answer to me saying that I've no idea how to summarize my job and it changes on probably a, an annual basis. And I, I, I hope it will continue to, but I think that's a privilege in and of itself. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. I hope, I hope it will continue to, and that's a privilege. Yeah, I think like one thing that I've often, again, this is very much a first world problem, but you know, when, well, when you're a doctor, it's easy to identify yourself with that label. And when you become, when you, when you leave medicine, the, it starts to feel like, oh, wait a minute, like what are the, what are the labels that I'm using for myself now? And it seems increasingly like, more and more people I, I seem to interview on the podcast, people I become friends with, people who seem to be living, like have, have built a life that they love, aren't, I, are no longer identifying with a single label. And a lot of it is multi-hyphenate or, you know, all the slashes and some, a bit, a, a few inverted, uh, a few, a few speech marks. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. I think like one thing that I, I, I sometimes struggle with is thinking, uh, what does this career look like when I'm 50? Am I still going to be saying, what's up, you guys? Welcome to the channel. Um, because when you're a doctor or a lawyer, it's just like obviously you're going to continue doing that forever. But I, I like I like the framing that it that it is in fact a privilege to be able to change what you do basically every year. Yeah, again, as long as you're thinking hard about it. Um, and I think yeah, I mean you know in a way I you know as a magazine journalist, um, you know first and foremost that was you know I did have that as a profession, but I remember sitting in a meeting with my uh, my MA course tutor um at, at the end and she said you know where do you see yourself in five years and I said well I've got no idea like I you know in the time I've been doing this course two of the magazines that I thought I'd have a career at you know for the next 10 years have closed down so I don't know what's happening here you know and, and it's, you know even I don't think podcasting at that time when I was doing those studies was even taught now it's a key element of the course like it constantly I guess we're getting new ways to be creative. Um, you know, thankfully, there's not too many different routes to practice medicine. I, I think it probably should say the case. Yeah, but probably. It's um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, slowly evolving and and you know, traditional and um and and based on science. Um, but uh, you know, and, and same with law. You know, that's a, that's a slow evolving profession. It is. It is. There is something scary, and I think possibly even you know, I'm I'm sure it was much scarier for you in a way stepping away from you know, from the medical world and, and knowing that you had something very set moving towards something that was, that was not, that was chaos and does involve these constant reassessments. Um, and you know, do you, how do you, how do you get over that fear of like thinking sort of in 
you know, when I'm 50, will I still be doing this? How, what, how do you, what do you tell yourself at night? Um, I do a lot of journaling, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's been, that's been the way I deal with these, with these things. Uh, one of my mentors said to me that at one point that like, like ev everyone has insecurity about their careers. When you're employed in a job, you have insecurity. Like, well, what does my manager think of me? Will I continue to be here in whatever, however many years? And when you work for yourself, the insecurity is a bit more existential. Like, will my business continue to, to exist? Will I continue to be relevant? And so one of the useful things that I found was to recognize that this is by no means novel. Like everyone has some level of insecurity about their careers. I think the second level up for me was I was um, being interviewed on a podcast called School of Greatness by Lewis Hose. And we were talking about sort of at the time I was dabbling with some part-time medicine locums here and there. And he, I, I kind of said to him, oh yeah, you know, I want to I wanna do a shift a week just because I keep my skills up so that I've got, I've got medicine as a backup option. And he was like, hold, hold up. Are you really telling me that with the skills that you've developed over the last 10 years of like web design and media and marketing and YouTube and video editing, all this shit, like you couldn't find a way to make 50K a year? And you'd have to go back to medicine. And it's like, before that conversation, I'd never really considered it as like skill acquisition. Mm. And now having kind of now got that kind of firmware update in my mind and having spoken to a bunch of people on this podcast about that, like your, I guess like stepping back here, like what is a career? Like a, a career is the thing that lets you make money. Like if you if you if you if you had a, had a hundred million in the bank, you wouldn't be worried about like, oh, what, what, what's my career do? You'd be doing the thing you want to do purely for service and like volunteering or you know, stuff like that. And so, to to me, it's like I need to do a thing that makes money to fund my lifestyle. But the fact that I have skills that I trust will be able to make money at some point further down the line is the thing that made me feel more okay with stepping away from medicine. Because in medicine, you have a certain set of skills which an employer i.e. the NHS or whatever values. But as a non-medic, as a person with this kind of multi-hyphenate thing, like you as well, you know, you've got the skills of writing and marketing and selling to an extent. And those skills are themselves valuable in the marketplace. Um, and for me, like the, the, the place I try to get to is like not overthinking this it, because it's easy to, I find that every, every, almost every night my journal starts with like, right, what the hell does my career look like? And it's almost easy to overthink that. And I, a, few, a, few, a few nights ago, I landed on, on the phrase that, you know what, if I'm doing something that I enjoy, that's helping people and that's making money, and I'm doing sensible things with that money, it doesn't really matter. Like, I don't need to have a 10-year plan because 10-year plans are a complete myth. <laughs> uh, and I can just, at each season of life, at each stage, reassess, am I still having fun? Am I still helping people? And am I still making some amount of money? And as long as those things continue to be true, then I think... It, it's all right for the career to be more circuitous than a traditional medical path. Yeah, yeah. I think being able to, I guess, those core values, right? It's a bit, um, yeah, it seems counterintuitive, but, you know, as long as those questions can be answered, you know, even if that question is, yeah, how am I going to make the baseline level of money every year? And then, you know, and then as we, you know, as, as you say, you kind of, you get on, when, when you're realizing that the career is working for you, you then can ask yourself the questions of like how fulfilling it is. Because also I think that, and, but, you know, perhaps a sort of limitation with having a, you know, exciting multi-hyphenate career that you are proud of, that you've made yourself, there will be more of a work-life blend sometimes. There will be the fact that even that existential um, questioning is, is entering your journaling space after hours, it, yeah. it will come into it. Um, I, I think it's a worthy sacrifice, definitely, but it's it's realizing. How do you, how have you navigated, I wonder also, um, there is, when you said, you know, a job is something that makes you money, right? That's what a career is. I find so often it for some people, it's what they say at parties as well. Mm, that was a really yeah. wonderful thing I found during the pandemic. There were no parties. So you never had to justify yourself. Yeah. So, so while I was making up what I was doing, that was not something I needed to even like make up in person. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Like, I feel like we, there's that sense at parties sometimes that saying lawyer or doctor, um, was something that would tick the box. Um, I never quite felt it with magazine journalism. I felt like it was glamorous enough, but I don't know. I think especially early on in my career, I found that maybe difficult. Yeah. Unless I was, I, I think it was almost like being able to say I could work for a big brand, like saying Vogue was like, suddenly that was the thing. So I was like, oh, fine, parties are okay now. But then it came to yeah. a point where I was like, why am I living for what I say at parties? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I think, um, 
I, I, I could be just guessing here, but like, um, I think when people are younger in their careers and you feel like, you feel like you want to impress, you want to be impressive and you kind of know that like, you know, this person is going to like the, you know, when, when the question of what do you do inevitably comes up, there's going to be that moment of like the other person judging, are you the sort of person that's worth speaking to? And I think I've been fortunate in that doctor was always sufficiently. I, well, actually, in a, in a lot of circles, the doctor is sort of boring, but it does, if everyone else you know is a doctor, but then it, it does prompt a certain conversation. What's your specialty? Like, where are you working? All that kind of stuff. And I was lucky in that, like, my YouTube career was sufficiently successful after I dropped the label of being a doctor that, in a way, I would almost joke, like, oh, I'm unemployed. I don't, I don't really work. I just kind of, I just kind of bum around on the internet. And that was, I guess also a status flex in a way. And like I was, I think I was, I was speaking to Cal Newport about this as well, where he was, he was like, yeah, back in the day, um, professor at a university was a high status thing to identify yourself as. These days, if you just identify yourself as a writer, that's almost even more high status because now people are like, oh, how much money do you make? Like, you know, the fact that you're calling yourself a writer means that you, and, and then, and, and then the, 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 the gears start to turn. And so I don't know, I feel like that question is always fraught with some level of status anxiety and being like, I'm a doctor conveys a certain status. Oh, I, I bum around on the internet also conveys a certain sense of status, which is like, oh, I'm, a, I'm above the game of labels. Yeah. But really that's just people that go super minimalist and use that as a status flex rather than buying the latest Louis Vuitton bag. That's so interesting. If any of that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. And I love, yeah, um, even the idea of status flex, it kind of, it, that that is quite new you know it used to be so much more about you know even i don't know, I, I kind of i don't know why this popped up into my head but you know, hundreds of years ago when you could only wear certain colors you could only wear purple if you were the king or something like that you know it was very very tight whereas now we all almost try and i don't know subtly signal to each other mm. um, our status so yeah I, yeah there was some stuff i was reading around like i think it was the 16 1700s or something where the aristocracy wouldn't be working. They'd just be having like leisure time and like enjoying themselves and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it was a mark of status to not have a job because why would you have a job? Like you're a part of the aristocracy. And then over time, um, industrial revolution, capitalism, all that jazz, it then has become a marker of status to be super busy and to be a like high powered executive and all that stuff. And I wonder if we're now going back into the olden era of like, Really, the high status people are the ones who have sold their company for tens of millions or, or, and are now just bumming around. <laughs> and this is, there's almost this sort of culture counterculture movement going on with, I guess, in, in certain circles. I guess if you're, a if you're at a law firm networking event, being partner at a law firm is still a high status thing. I suppose but, so. But yeah, I, it, that has changed. And I wonder, I mean, yeah, the pandemic really was this giant, weird social experiment no one asked for, right? But I wonder how much that's changed our sense of status or you know i even you know I, I was having a conversation a couple of months ago with a you know a close friend who um is a consultant and you know he has this amazing job um and she you know, she was looking to move and she you know since has um and she what she was looking for from her next role and i think almost the conversation that was being had amongst her and her friends was like oh yeah but you know do you get to go I don't know, shopping in the afternoon on a Wednesday, or do you get to, you know, have an extra day? Like, do you get to, you know, work from home half of the time or whatever? And that has become, I think, a state of sin in and of itself. That almost like work from home, that leisure. Like, we're sort of, yeah. I guess, I guess, in a way, the pandemic just expedited the loss of what was happening already. But I do like that theory of yours that we're all sort of moving towards. I wonder if that's something to do with how everyone, a lot of people are not just digital nomading, but there's also the other state of symbol of moving to kent like we just oh, move, yeah. moving to yeah, yeah moving out of london to kent <laughs> to work from there i wonder if that's that's what everyone's secretly doing everyone's gonna secretly start you know yeah um setting up their their farming or their <laughs> no, quite yeah exactly um there's been some yeah like amongst the tech bros that i follow on twitter there's this one guy who's like it sh shares photos of him on his little family ranch. He's like, yeah, I've just got, you know, just does some open source library JavaScripty stuff, makes enough money to get by. And he's like, all these, all these other people who are in the big city and like living in shitty apartments in San Francisco to work for a high powered tech company, they've got it wrong. Like really the, the true value is in being in nature and being with your family and building a house with your kids. 
And I'm like, that's that's pretty cool. But it's like, yeah, it's it's interesting how it like depending on what circle you're in and what stage of life you're at and and the time as well, like what is high status seems to change. Completely, yeah. Final thing I wanted to ask you about, some people might, you know, have gotten to the end of this, might be thinking, you know, they would love to have the sort of life that you do where you can seemingly kind of do the things that you love. There's not much difference between winning lottery version of Francesca and today version of Francesca in terms of how you're spending your time. Do you have any tips for people who might be in a job, maybe like the jobs that you used to have when you had a quote real job, um, who are thinking that like, oh, I'd, I'd love to have that sort of multi-hyphenate freelancy type career? Hmm. Um, to begin with, I, you know, I think very seriously about it. Um, again, as I say, I, for various reasons, um, you know, many of which, because I think fundamentally, you know, the magazine industry is a difficult one to have a long-term career in. I think that being freelance, being self-employed, um, works for me. Um, but you know, if you, if you're in a, an industry where you think you can be rewarded and you think there is scope to have a good, you know, full-time or part-time job and keep with that, you know, I definitely wouldn't under, I definitely wouldn't underestimate the potential within that or think that the grass is always greener. I think that, you know, increasingly companies are really looking to look after their employees. Um, so I think, you know, I, again, wouldn't just jump ship, um, and, and, you know, throw, throw everything out. Um, I think you definitely, you know, be thoughtful about what you're getting rid of to begin with, um, and the risks that you're taking. Um, I think it's just, you know, daring to dream. Um, and let me claw that back from the Instagram cliche. It sounds like, like, I think daring to, I think it's scary to put things down on paper. It was scary for me three years ago to think, okay, I'm going to write a book and start a podcast. And no one else knew this idea I had and like, no one was supporting me. And like, no, like, and you know, he was doing it alongside my full-time job for a, a long time before I was able to leave to do it. But I think I think it's just acknowledging like it's really 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 scary um, to begin with, and it will be for everyone. Um, but but you've you've got to be able to at least write it down and admit it to yourself. And and you know and I think when you are thinking about those things, and you know, not just what you want to do, but also the values that you want, what's the life you want to have, especially if you think that your career is going to be something that will tap into your work life balance. Is that you know if you're not the kind of person that wants to leave their job at nine to five or whatever the equivalent of that is the you know these days like i think it's um you know really thinking seriously about how that's going to work in terms of your other life goals like quite holistically um and just you know put down those values think you know do i want more creativity in my job can i get that from my hobbies do i want a bit of both you know do i want more leadership what do i want more autonomy what do i want um and then it's thinking about how to make that work you know and 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 owning that rather than i think quite often um i think we were saying a bit earlier quite often when you're in in a job you know you'll come home and you'll still have all the doubts and worries about work but it will be about the promotion cycle or your boss saying that weird thing to you and I think we need to be able to step back from that and think okay like you know what do I want and what can I then what can I then ask for you know asking within your existing job um and if you've got a clear-cut sense of what you want not just oh this boss is toxic I think that's a you know that's that's a limited philosophy whereas if you think okay I want to have more autonomy in my work how am I going to do that that that's a better approach you know going in exploring avenues within your own um full-time employment if that's where you are or you know exploring avenues outside it um you know i think that's really important um to be able to look at all the different ways um to feed these values in and outside of work um and then i think you know also um you know if it is um creativity specifically there's a book called big magic um by uh liz gilbert who's the woman who wrote um eat pray love um, and some advice she gives, she says, do not quit your day job until you absolutely have to. And that's, you know, that's the advice that definitely I would give in, you know, as someone who did, you know, I, I did leave my day job. I did, um, start my podcast and I did, you know, I, I got my book deal fairly, you know, fairly early on at, at, in terms of when I, you know, how long I've been talking about this topic and it allowed me to leave my job to match my salary to spend a year writing a book, which was, you know, it was a dream come true, but, I didn't do that until I knew that I had the deal. I didn't know that until financially I knew that was viable. I think there's risks and then there's calculated risks. Um, and, you know, another thing Liz Gilbert says is, you know, no, no one wants to be like the, you know, the kind of 
a starving, tortured artist. Like no, no one wants you to be that person. You know, do things out of passion. Do them as a hobby for as long as you can, if they're bringing you joy, because it won't feel like work alongside your existing work. Um, and you know, if you're putting that much joy and energy and faith into it, then and you and you know that you know not to sound too woo woo, and you know that it's benefiting other people. Then the money will come, the avenue out will come. Um, but don't just think that leaping and, you know, throwing everything away f is the, is the way to go. Like definitely just, you know, yeah, I, I think lean in, lean into what your curiosity is and, you know, think about how, just think holistically about how you can get that from your life and your working life. Cause it is possible and it looks different for everyone. Um, but if, you know, if you care enough that it can, then will happen. All right, Francesca, thank you so much. Um, where can people find out more about you, find out more about the book? So um, I am on, uh, despite how much I've slagged it off, I am on <laughs> social media. So uh, Instagram and Twitter, that's uh, Chez, so C-H-E-Z, uh, Spectre um, on, on both. Um, I am also on um, my uh, website, alonement.com. If you sign up there to my mailing list, you will be the first to hear about my uh, newsletter that will be coming out in the next couple of months. Um, so that will be going forward be uh, the best way to uh to keep in touch um and then obviously you know my podcast is my main thing at the moment um the alonement podcast it's on everywhere you can find the podcast and the book alonement how to be alone and absolutely own it is also available um sort of hardback paperback um kindle and audiobook um narrated by myself so uh yeah if you if you liked what you hear guys then that's that's available um online um wherever yeah wherever you get your books brilliant and we'll have links to all of those in the video description and in the show notes um any final asks final pieces of advice for people who just that I, you know what i think on the subject of alone time i think that i you know i think that people see me and think that it's easy all the time or that it just comes naturally it doesn't it's it's a it's a value and it will be easier and harder at different times in your life but there will never be a life stage or a relationship status where taking 10 minutes for yourself won't be a, honestly a life-changing thing to do. So I just encourage everyone to know that it's hard, but it's worthy. And yeah, it will change your life. It changed mine. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.